Hello and uh, welcome to the Glasgow University History Society's own podcast. Joining me today we have... John. And... You're pointing uh, to yourself, Robbie. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yourself. <laughs> and you have Nathan McLennan. And today we are investigating Carolinian Europe. On Christmas Day 800, the Pope crowned Charles King of the Franks as the Roman Emperor, the first ruler of Western Europe to bear that title in 325 years. It was a fitting title for a ruler who had achieved so much in his reign. From the ruler of Frankish Neustria, he had expanded westward to the river Oder, south to Rome and to Barcelona, and all the way north to Frisia and Jutland. In doing so, he irrevocably altered the history of Europe, introducing the idea of a universal Christian monarchy spanning the continent. The dynasty he founded would struggle to rule the empire he created, and during this time the empire fostered an artistic and intellectual renaissance across Europe. Today we examine the life and legacy of one of the most fascinating and misunderstood figures in European history. Right, that's all you need to know. So, may as well start with the man himself, the life of Charlemagne. Ruled as king from 706 to 814, and the first thing people know about him is his conquests, of which there were many. So perhaps we should start by looking at his wars of aggression, his wars of expansion, and what he really achieved through this. They're not nearly as smooth as they seem at first. They are very, very rocky, especially his conquests that happened quite early on of Saxony. So Saxony is a province of, um, well, Germany. We call today wider Germany in the northeast. And it, at this point, was still very undersettled. Um, most of the settlements there were no larger than very small towns or would just be villages with far, surrounding farms. Uh, and they weren't unified under a central political figure. Uh, and although this did change later on with the revolt of Wudekind, the initial um, incursions of the Franks into Saxony seem to be a result of Saxon raids on the Franks uh, rather than just unprovoked aggression. But Charlemagne did wage a very bloody and zealous campaign to expunge what he viewed as Saxon paganism, uh, which was quite similar to Norse paganism. They burned Irminzul, which is a large tree that was uh, said to represent something very important to the Germanic Saxons and uh, also took a lot of treasure from the area. And even though this happened uh, and Charlemagne did make successful incursions into what was normally viewed as Saxon territory, it being a very nebulous concept, it's a very wide region and there are no central rulers. So even though he did manage these incursions, the Saxons would very much just sort of give a nod to Charlemagne's authority and then just go back to doing whatever they were doing before he, before he came in when he left. Because Charlemagne was often called off to various different campaigns during the Saxon Wars. This meant that the Saxon Wars lasted up to 30 years of continual invasion of Saxony, burning things down there and forcing people to submit and convert to Christianity, leaving again, and then finally the Saxons would... Uh, reverted to their previous position of staunch independence. At one point, they unified, uh, well, unified is quite a loose term. They, uh, there was a large revolt under a man known as Widukind, uh, which was later put down by Charlemagne, and this was the most famous of the numerous Saxon revolts against Charlemagne's rule. The bloody verdict of Verdun, as it is known, uh, where 4,000 Saxons uh, were put to the death uh, at Verdun for their refusal to, to uh, join Christianity and join the church. Uh, so it shows that the war from a very early starting point is viewed in religious terms. The Saxons are pagans, they are the enemy, we are invading to defend Christendom from this pagan non-Christian force and spread Christianity to this foe. It's interesting that Unlike most other sort of uh, territory, territorial expansion, it's, it's religious, isn't it? It's like compared to what we conceive as expansion nowadays, it's totally territorial, like with Second World War and loads of other invasions. But 
it's quite interesting that it's based solely on the conversion of the pagan Saxons. That seems to have been one of the main causes, yeah. And it is quite unusual viewing it from a modern starting point because we tend to view like the concept of religious war these days as yeah. quite a backward thing, but it was very much a valid justification in the eyes of medieval Europe. Other people could say it's sort of an excuse uh, because the Saxons did have uh, large treasuries at holy sites like Ermanzol. And so to go in and plunder those gets uh, Charlemagne a lot of treasure that he can use to disperse throughout his uh, most favored vassals to make sure they're broadly on side with him for the duration of his campaign and ensure they support his kingship. Do you reckon that uh, any papal intervention was a sort of impetus for expansion? In some cases, definitely. In other uh, wars fought by Charlemagne, the Pope definitely played a major role. For example, in his conquest of Lombardy, the Kingdom of the Lombards, Charlemagne intervened directly on behalf of the Pope, whose territory was coming under threat uh, by the Lombard king. Uh, and after, after conquering Lombardy, he uniquely decided to take on the title of King of the Lombards, which... Yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah, it's like a sort of... From what I remember from learning about this period in first year is that it was a sort of attempt to assimilate them into this vast empire, isn't it? Like, because in relative terms, this is quite an unprecedented size empire in the West, in Western Europe since the collapse of the Roman Empire. So I think it's, it's quite a shrewd idea to sort of assimilate them by naming himself King of the Lombards. And I'm pretty sure that he gave a relative s sense of, uh, independence to them to some extent from what I remember Absolutely you're definitely right there. Charlemagne is a very unique figure because of well part of the reasons he is such a unique figure is one of the ways he governs because mm. he isn't an absolute monarch his entire realm is predicated on a loose sort of agreement between his vassals that they are nominally under him and that they believe him to be their superior and their sovereign, and they will follow him insofar as he can provide goods and treasure and stability to them as they can uh, warriors to him. Yeah. And so in naming himself King of the Lombards, he sort of affirms that he's not a Frankish king out to destroy Lombardy and make the Lombards Franks. He is a Frankish king who also uh, happens to rule over the Lombards and is just going to give them the leeway to do their thing because... To do otherwise is just going to invite instability. Hmm. And I think it's quite interesting that all of this is united in 800 on Christmas Day when he's sort of crowned emperor, uh, like the Roman emperor in uh, by the Pope. So it's interesting that though, as we've just established that, though seemingly contradictory what we just said, that it's sort of accepting that they have some extent of independence, but they're united under Christianity. So I think that's quite interesting that that is a device that sort of cements not only Charlemagne's power, but the papacy's as well. It's a very unique thing, uh, that aspect sort of comes from Alcuin and the scholarly court of Charlemagne, um, which, yeah. is, um, which we'll go on to talk about in a wee bit. Uh, first, I would quite like to look into some of the early conquests of Charlemagne's reign, because the Saxon Wars were an intermittent thing that went throughout. The Lombard Wars happened once he was already established in Francia. But before that, he faced a notable revolt by Odo of Aquitaine, the, who was the vassal of his brother, Carloman. And Carloman later mysteriously died, leaving Charlemagne to inherit. And it's widely believed um, by historians these days that Carloman was assassinated by Charlemagne. The revolt against Odo shows that Charlemagne, from a very early point in his career, was really dead set against ruling with his brother. He was, his brother was made king of, I believe, Austrasia, uh, whereas Charlemagne took on Neustria, which is the newer of the Frankish kingdoms, Austrasia being sort of the homeland of the Franks. And so in the battle with Odo of Aquitaine, Charlemagne really takes the initiative and he charges in to deal with this rebel vassal that technically belongs to his brother, 
and then forces uh, his integration into the territory of Neustria rather than to go back to Carloman's Austrasia in defeating him. And uh, there was a tense standoff at the time between Charlemagne and his brother. Uh, Charlemagne's brother, Carloman, later left uh, the field of battle uh, and ceded the territory. So it shows from a, from a very early starting point, Charlemagne is willing to stick to his guns on issues. He is willing to be aggressive to people who are nominally his allies and friends, uh, as viewed in his treatment of Tassilo of Bavaria later on. So he is this very powerful figure, even though he doesn't have a necessarily centralized administration or a absolute control over his realm, he does know how to act to keep it stable, how to expand it, and generally keep things in good stead. Another example of this could perhaps be viewed in his handling of Tassilo of Bavaria, uh, who is sort of the main case study. Uh, as, as many people know, the lecturer Stuart Early uh, wrote a fair bit on um, his sort of relationship between Charlemagne and Tassilo of Bavaria. So from his book, Power and Its Problems in Carolinian Europe. Let me just, just say that Stuart Early has not paid us to plug his book. I wish he had, though. It would be great. It'd be great to have him on one of these days. Yeah, we should have him on one of these days. What are the chances of, of him turning up on this show? Uh, it's wishful thinking. If you have a hundred quid to spare, power and its problems in Carolingian Europe is the book for you. Absolutely. And it does go into this sort of um, handling of Tassilo of Bavaria. Uh, it's characterized as both ruthless and skillful. To give some context, Tassilo of Bavaria owed um, some fealty to the predecessor of Charlemagne, um, who I believe is Pepin the Short. However, once he ascended to the throne in Bavaria, he was viewed as a contender to Charlemagne's rule and authority because Tassilo was viewed to have a higher dynastic legitimacy. Um, the house of, I believe it was Agalolfing, that he belonged to, uh, had a, a greater pedigree than the Carolinians at that point. Because the Carolinians were very much upstarts to begin with. They uh, started off by usurping the, power, the position of king uh, from the Merovingian dynasty after being after they were mayors of the palace, which basically means they're sort of viceroys. They sort of rule the kingdom in the name of uh, the Merovingians. And it was after a controversy with Pope Zachary, uh, one of the Carolinian mayors of the palace asked, is it really okay for the king to wield no power at all? Uh, to which the Pope responded, no, fair play, and uh, appointed the Carolinians to be rulers of the Franks. Um, whereas Tassilo had uh, received his uh, control over Bavaria, um, as a sort of, inf I believe it was an enfeoffment by, uh, what well, was affirmed as an, inf as an enfeoffment by one of the earlier Carolinians. So they've got more of a, it may have been the Merovingians actually, sorry. But they were perceived to have a larger pedigree to uh, Charlemagne's Carolinians. And Tassilo was also a very competent ruler and also a threat. So upon uh, a viewed insubordination, uh, Charlemagne invaded Tassilo's territory, full on uh, with most of his armies. And Bavaria, being quite a small territory, uh, was overwhelmed. And so Tassilo surrendered to Charlemagne and gave him vassalage by handing over a scepter, which signified his right to rule, to Charlemagne. And Charlemagne granted him the Duchy of Bavaria after... Uh, putting down his insubordination, which confirmed him as a direct vassal to Charlemagne. This, in turn, enabled uh, Charlemagne to dispose of Tassilo in full at a council in Ingelheim. Uh, the Carolinians under Charlemagne held uh, two different councils every year, uh, one of which was usually at Ingelheim. One was a sort of collection of the greater nobles of the Frankish realm, and the other was a more general council of the nobles of the Frankish realm. So no luck if you're a peasant, but if you're a noble, you're in the council. And at this council in Ingelheim, they uh, formally deposed Tassilo as a traitor, and he was tonsured and sent into monastic retirement. So it shows he's a very ruthless ruler as well. He, uh, he 
doesn't really take any shit from his vassals. He's going to bring down the hammer of them the minute they step out of line. So he's a very strong man ruler at this uh, point in European history. Yes, indeed, the personification of the Christian emperor. So final point to his conquest, I thought we might mention his activities in the south. He created, on either side of the Pyrenees, a Christian march between Francia and the Caliphate of Cordoba, which may be seen as one of the earliest military interactions between a Western Christian dynasty and the Muslim world. And in fact, the last major conquest of the Carolingians in terms of outward expansion was uh, creating the county of Barcelona, which occurred in the final years of his reign. Anyway, I think that was an excellent point to move on to the perception of Charlemagne. Now, obviously, Charlemagne, as the emperor, is seen as a great watershed moment in European history. He is the man who restored the great imperial state in the Western European continent. Although he was crowned by the Pope, he actually wrote to the Byzantine Emperor asking for permission before he adopted the title of Roman Emperor. So perhaps now we can look at what Charlemagne as an emperor meant to later generations of Christian rulers. How much of an ideal was he to live up to? He was viewed as one of the last great unifiers. Um, this didactic character who um, was portrayed very, very positively in the only biographies we have of him, which is uh, Notker the Stammerer and uh, Ironhard's Life of Charlemagne, in which he is portrayed in a very positive light by uh, a contemporary courtier, someone who grew up and uh, lived alongside Charlemagne for much of his life. Very little is known about his early life. Charlemagne isn't portrayed as perfect in the depiction given by Einhard. His flaws are very much noted. Charlemagne had a fondness for the drink, and Charlemagne had a fondness for eating well. He was, um, he was a jolly king, and someone who very much enjoyed uh, the pleasures of life. That being said, he was also very, very ruthless. And though uh, Einhard paints this ruthlessness as a necessity, it can be argued to overstep the bounds in certain areas. For example, the massacre of Verdun and his handling of Tassilo of Bavaria. Well, it's an interesting point you should mention Einhardt's depiction of Charlemagne and his drinking and his eating and his enjoyment of life. Although the one hand those are obviously vices in the traditional Christian mould, they are also exactly what one would expect of a Frank. And one of the things that Einhardt returns to many times is the idea of Charlemagne as a, an ideal Frank. He is a hunter, he is an expert horseman. He is a real man's man. He loves the outdoors. He's a soldier and he's a feaster. So it's an interesting dichotomy between what, on the one hand, a Christian king is expected to do and what, on the other hand, were the expectations on, within Charlemagne's particular culture. Although he may well be a, a universal figure within Christendom, he uh, at no point really rose above his cultural origins and he is still, throughout his life, very much a Frank. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I suppose when it comes down to it, uh, religion and society, they sort of stimulate together. So it it, it goes 50-50. It's like one hand and the other, isn't it? Like, despite these pious, virtuous Christian ideals are sort of doted over uh, by the Franks, I'm sure, especially in monasteries and certain sections of uh cultural society then again it goes with the other hand that uh, uh, a, a people's culture is just as important really so I suppose it does it is just as revered to some extent so I suppose yeah it's it's interesting to say that about culture generally just beyond the medieval period even indeed and uh, during the reign of Charlemagne's son Louis the Pious his lack of these attributes, these manly, outdoorsy, quite masculine attributes, counts against him in the eyes of courtiers. He's accused of being too much like a Byzantine, God forbid. Which is in and of itself a very interesting thing, because the Franks were, in the West at least, viewed as the heirs to the Roman Empire. So when 
they sort of emulate this Eastern and decadence and opulence. They're looked down upon by their contemporaries at home whilst very much reinforcing this idea of the more Romanesque style of rule. I think it's interesting because uh, even t today, Charlemagne is uh, viewed as the father of Western Europe. And it's uh, even despite the Romanesque style of uh, statecraft in the Byzantine Empire, it, it's interesting that that is what is sort of our foundational development, isn't it? It's, it's interesting. Very much is. Um, Charlemagne gives this uniquely good rule in the West. He is a warrior king. He shows that a, he embodies the ideal that a king is meant to be. He is meant to be a warrior. He is meant... Because Charlemagne, even though he was noted to have sponsored the arts and the Carolinian Renaissance, he himself was illiterate. Mm. He preferred to leave that to the church. And I think, actually, one of the precedents that Charlemagne created is that uh, the sort of scholarly world should be left to the church, whereas the physical world should be uh, manipulated and left to be dealt with by uh, strong rulers. I think that's an excellent segue to talk a bit more about culture of the empire. And there was plenty of it. But since we've been talking about Einhardt, we may as well start with the literature. So do we have anything to say maybe more about Einhardt as a writer and his biography of Charlemagne? Um, I think, as you said, Robbie, earlier, that these um, biographers of Charlemagne um, were courtiers themselves and that they were obviously quite close and they'd obviously received the emperor's grace at court. So I haven't actually read the text myself, but... It, it would be quite difficult to say that they wouldn't sort of be praising him due to their own contemporary climate of having to sort of dote over them anyway. Do you know what I mean? There is an interesting uh, addendum to that is that there are some instances where a writer may dare to be critical of the dynasty of the regime. In the 1830s, during one of the darkest periods of the reign of Louis the Pious, when it looked as though the dynasty's hold on power would slip, there's a poem that appears at court, which uh, scholars have uh, entitled Charlemagne in Hell. And uh, it's this image of torment and misery and destruction of this great and powerful figure. And the underlying implication is that Charlemagne, who's dead by this point, is suffering in hell. He's lost God's grace. And in doing so, his dynasty has lost God's grace on earth. So there are some mechanisms by which a writer may deem to be critical of a regime. Obviously not critical in the way that we would expect, but there is some scope for that. You do. Both of you make very good points in that while Einhard lavishes praise on Charlemagne uh, and his policies and his personal generosity and his personal qualities, um, this sort of thing would be expected of a courtier who is very close to the king. And any sort of criticism is unique that criticism can come from the church and not necessarily from uh, individual courtiers. Individual courtiers are derive their power from the ruling dynasty. So they are meant to be, or they are sort of leaning in towards sycophancy rather than honest portrayals. Whereas uh, the one who had the vision of Charlemagne in hell and Vetti of uh, Reichenau, he is a clergyman. And this sort of, this can get us into a wee bit of the uh, problem of two swords or the doctrine of two swords, uh, which is the church on one hand having this sort of spiritual authority and the secular uh, worldly authority of the ruler and i think the church is much feels itself much freer to criticize uh, worldly rulers as a result of the act of crowning charlemagne as a roman emperor because it shows that the right to crown this magnificently powerful figure on earth derives from the pope the vicar of christ on earth this viceroy of God in the world has the power to make kings and 
well, not sorry, make, not make kings, make emperors. It shows the church's unique authority in the matter and how much and how they are above uh, the criticism and contempt of worldly rulers. By and so, rather, they are able to criticize worldly rulers much freer than any um, any courtier is. That's a really good point because um, I'm actually quite interested in the period a little bit after this, where um, uh, later on, a, a century or two later, we see Pope Gregory the Seventh and his successor uh, Urban the Second, sort of creating this imperialistic. Uh, overarching continental and worldly power of the papacy in instigating the first crusade and uh, i'm pretty sure pope gregory the seventh actually led a cavalry charge against the normans at one point and lost so yeah it, it's sort of this idea that you, you're claiming is i completely agree it's that the papacy is it, it's sort of a, a political show that we have the vested power, not the Byzantine Empire, that we're backing our man Charlemagne in the secular world and not you over there in the East. And this only gets worse for the papacy. Their ego just gets so much bigger. And then obviously centuries, centuries later, we get a sort of repudiation of it in the Reformation, etc. And then further on down the line, it just gets worse. So yeah, it's quite interesting that this is a sort of focal point for the development of what happens thereafter. Absolutely. Um, this sort of assertion of papal authority in the secular world wouldn't really have been possible without a ruler like Charlemagne, um, someone who derives legitimacy and derives authority from it. And one of the very interesting things about the legal aspect of um, the time is that Charlemagne didn't really make laws as such until he was crowned as Roman Emperor. So it also gives this idea that being bestowed the title of Roman Emperor really means that you're the one who can actually make laws in a region. And until those laws are changed, you need to follow Roman law. So I think the entire um, prevalence of Roman law in the Western world uh, on the continent can be in fact attributed to Charlemagne's decision to take up the mantle of Western Roman Emperor. And there are those who do believe that, um, believe the narrative that, oh, this whole Roman Emperor thing was a mistake. Uh, Charlemagne didn't really want to be Roman Emperor, but that it's, it, as, as ambitious a man as Charlemagne is, I think it's more likely that it was negotiated uh, between him and Pope Hadrian that he would become Roman Emperor as part of uh, his intervention in papal affairs. Mm, yeah, I agree with that. When it comes to architecture and art and culture under the Carolinian dynasty, uh, the Palace of Aachen is perhaps a focal point. This, um, the one sort of permanent capital Charlemagne had, because of course he was uh, a mobile ruler. In medieval courts, you really... Usually you wouldn't just have one capital, especially in the early medieval period. You'd roam around and uh, try to find different places uh, of power that you could hold court. And um, Charlemagne at Aachen really tried to sort of cement his power in one permanent area with this uh, large, beautiful palace uh, built, near, built near Bath's um, hot springs, sort of a... Um, something that Charlemagne and Einhard is noted to have a fondness for. So this really nice strategic location in Aachen uh, becomes the capital, in a sense, of uh, Charlemagne's empire. And he builds this beautiful palace that's uh, not really surpassed for a number of years. Indeed, and if you're ever near Aachen, I'd recommend you visit it. One final note on literature, uh, those of you who are fans of women's literature and medieval literature might be interested in the work of one Duoda from the Carolingian period, who composed a manual of court etiquette and political life for her son. It's very rare that we get a fully surviving manuscript written by a woman, but this is one of the exceptions and demonstrates through its instructions, 
What was expected of uh, Carolingian nobles in the period? The aim of the manuscript was to train her son to succeed at court after his father, who had previously been very prominent, had unfortunately fallen from power and been executed. And it's done again from the perspective of somebody who was intimately involved with the process. So, lesser known but vital part of uh, the Carolingian literary corpus. Right. After Charlemagne's death, power was handed over to his only surviving legitimate son, Louis the Pious. Sadly, the son wasn't equal to the father, as is so often the case. Louis was essentially deposed in all but name in 835 and died in 840, after which the empire sent to civil war among Louis' three sons, which led to the Treaty of Verdun. 843, the empire was split into three parts, Lotharingia, West Francia, East Francia. And with one brief exception during the reign of the Carolingian Charles the Bald in the 880s, when the empire was briefly reunited, there would never be a single Carolingian polity ever again. And after 888, the Carolingians begin to lose power within their respective realms. They're eventually replaced by the Ottonians in East Francia and the Capetians in West Francia. And after that, the Carolingians are consigned to history. So, great achievements from Charlemagne, but in the overall grand scheme of things, the dynasty didn't last that long. So, thinking about the legacy, do we think the Carolingians were successful? Or are they as influential as they are portrayed? I think uh, the Carolingian Renaissance has really stuck in with Western Europe, if, if any legacy there is. Uh, I think this, this sort of, as we discussed, the sort of separation of secular and te uh, spiritual power, um, the need to sort of educate uh, people at court. I think that that lives on, even in England, with uh, in Anglo-Saxon England, in Wessex with uh, King Alfred, he, he does the same thing. Um, and I think th things like that d are quite important for the development in history. So yeah, I, th I think definitely yeah, there is a, a definite sort of Renaissance legacy in that sense. Uh, but in terms of political power, it was just a trajectory of going upwards, upwards, and then a sudden sort of terminal decline with Louis the Pious and then with uh, the successes then and then the splitting up of all this, the empire from the the king the kingdom on the left and then the middle kingdom and then the kingdom in around Germany. Uh, I think that once it's split up between the Etonians and the Capetians, I think that yeah, obviously that's that's the end of it there. So politically, not so much. But what do you guys think? Personally, I think the lasting influence of the Carolinian dynasty is the fact that they set up the doctrine of two swords. This idea of secular and papal authority and how they interlink and which one is superior to the other. And in medieval Europe, the question was ultimately decided that God is the superior of the two and that um, secular rulers need not um, match the uh, spiritual. Uh, and I think without Charlemagne's crowning at Rome by the Pope, uh, this doctrine would definitely not have been so strongly decided in favour of the papacy. It, it seems that this sort of use Charlemagne trying to use Christianity as a unifying factor because his kingdom was so ethnically diverse. You had fra you had many of them were Germanic, but it was all different types of Germanic. So you'd have Franks, Burgundians, Saxons, Thuringians. And to unify all these diverse groups, Charlemagne decided on Christianity, um, as helped by Alcuin, his uh, scholar from uh, the uh, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, who was appointed as one of his grand advisors. And so using Christianity as a unifying factor with, between otherwise splintered kingdoms and uh, giving the papacy the influence it did, I think, is the ultimate legacy of Carolinian Europe. It enabled the papacy to come to power, in a sense, as the um, spiritual 
ruler of all of Europe. Or at least the Catholic part of Europe. Indeed. I'd certainly say that Charlemagne is one of the most misunderstood and in many ways misused figures in European history. It's used by the European Union as an icon of European unity. It's used by various fascist groups as an icon of European purity. He's used by various Christian groups as the uh, epitome of some sort of Christian ideal. At the end of the day, I don't think he was any of these things. He was like Alexander the Great or like Julius Caesar, one of those noteworthy figures who took history into their hands and altered the world they lived in irrevocably. And although, as John said, his political dynasty wasn't any more long-lived than any other dynasty, the fact that he cast such a long shadow over history and the fact that he is so present in the European mind in itself is a more enduring legacy than anything that he or his successors could have built in the political realm. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Absolutely. Right, do we have any, any final comments, any other remarks? When looking at the figure of Charlemagne in particular, it is important to note, I can't quite remember who said this, it may have been early, it may have been one of the other uh, uh, sources I'll um, put in the description once we finish this, but Charlemagne didn't know that he was Charlemagne. He, there was no overarching idea of Charlemagne knowing he was this destined figure who was going to conquer most of Europe. Most of his policy decisions can't be viewed in light of he is this majestic and powerful figure. He was very much going with the political situation at the time and what made sense to him and his court and what would appease them and keep them in line at the time. So even though it could be argued the administration of the Carolinian Empire was inefficient, which I would agree it is, um, it was the political reality of the time that dictated that. And though Charlemagne was a great figure, he couldn't necessarily um, see himself as the be-all, end-all. He didn't know that he was going to be this revered, didactic figure. He was a king, and a pretty good one at that, by his own reckoning, but he had no idea the, uh, the sort of prestige and power that he had and would go on to have. Right, well, that's us about done for today. Next episode, we'll be looking at the mind and the world of Niccolo Machiavelli. And until then, goodbye. Goodbye. See you later on, folks.